Inshallah, we're going to be studying the history of an amazing part of the Muslim world. A part of the Muslim world that a lot of us, unfortunately, don't know about. Maybe we've heard some things about it. But, you know, our knowledge of it is very limited. And that is the history of Islam in China. I'll, I'll start giving an example of something. When I say the name Aladdin, you know, Aladdin from the, the cartoons and things like this, yeah. what do you usually think of? You think of the Middle East. I mean, you, you watch the cartoon of Aladdin, it looks like the streets of Cairo. You wouldn't know any better. How many of us realize the story of Aladdin is actually set in China? Aladdin was set in China. Aladdin is a Chinese Muslim living in China. They, uh, because you see that many parts of China, especially going towards the west of China, it's not China like you know of, you know, Beijing and, you know, all of these areas. You get to the areas where it's almost 100% Muslim. Of course, the story is nonsense. But the, the example that I love to give is that Aladdin was a Chinese Muslim. This is something that you know, flies over most people's heads. And if you read the story of Aladdin, in the first few sentences, it says Aladdin was in China. So this is something to introduce that, yes, there are Muslims in China. They play a great part in the history of the Ummah, but they've been largely forgotten, unfortunately. Now, when we look at the, the spread of Islam, as we know, we've mentioned, you know, Islam spread throughout the Middle East, from Mecca, going, you know, in all directions. And Islam spread through what we call the Silk Road. The Silk Road is basically the way between the Middle East and China, you know, the Central Asian states. Now, from the very beginning of Islam, we're talking at the time of Uthman, radiallahu anhu. He sent an envoy to China. So he sent a group of Muslims to China. And one of the people he sent was the Sahabi Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, radiallahu anhu. So Sa'ad, he actually visited China. He was an envoy on behalf of, uh, of Uthman. And it said that his father actually came with him. So Abi Waqqas, his father came, and he's actually buried in China. And there was, a, there was a masjid that was built, because when the Chinese emperor received them, he was so proud you know, to, to have a relation with the Muslim empire, that he built a masjid in their honor. Uh, he built uh, the masjid of the Huaixiang Mosque. Huaixiang, it actually means, uh, means like a memorial mosque. And the reason why he did this, the Chinese emperor, was to honor the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. It was actually erected in the memory of the Prophet. So he said, this empire that was started by him, the relations that we have, I want to build a masjid on your behalf. And at the Huaixiang Mosque, it said that the father of Sa'ad ibn Abu Waqqas, Abu Waqqas himself is actually buried there, subhanAllah. Well, what happened as, as we're looking, you know, uh, the Prophet, uh, sorry, Uthman, عنه, he sent his envoy. So Muslims were visiting China very early on. You know, they were going there for trade. The Chinese wanted to trade with the Muslims. The Muslims wanted to trade with the Chinese. So you had this relationship going on of traders going through and actually became established in here. Now, you see that uh, from where, uh, where Sa'ad actually visited, there was a city called Guangzhou. Later on became known as Canton. It is one of the, the largest cities in the world up until now. And even at the time, it was one of the largest cities in the world. China is a very big country. But no doubt, you know, trade up until today, you know, trade is a large part of the Chinese culture. And we're going to sort of elaborate on this a little bit later, how the, the, the trade relationship between the Muslims and China continues until today. So we saw at this time, you know, very early on, we're talking um, in the year 616 this happens. It's not long after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Guangzhou, Guangzhou had four mosques, had four very big mosques that were built in this early stage. Uh, and as we said, you know, you had the father of Sa'ad that was visited, uh, buried there. Now, going on later, you know, the Muslims didn't really uh, influence Da'wah very strong. You know, for the next three, four hundred years, there were only very small steps made. It wasn't really till the year 1000 when a new dynasty took over. It was called the Song Dynasty. Now, once the Song Dynasty came into power, they actually put a Muslim in tra charge of all of their trade affairs. Like, you know how you've got a trade minister who looks after all of the trade? It was actually a Muslim. The, you know, the office of the director of the general of shipping was always held by a Muslim. The law of the dynasty said that a Muslim must hold this because the Muslims were the key to trade. Yeah, they, you know, they were trustworthy, but they were also a key. And the Chinese saw this. The Chinese saw that using the Muslims you know, it would benefit themselves and it would benefit the Muslims. And you saw they had a respect for Islam. You know, the emperor would build a masjid. No, the, uh, generally you find most of the emperors, they didn't really have any issues. They had very, very good relationship with the Muslims. And from the, be from the beginning, you definitely saw most of the emperors welcome the Muslims. I mean, during the Song Dynasty, you know, the, the emperor at this time, he actually invited 
five and a half thousand Muslims from Bukhara. Now, Bukhara is in Central Asia, we know from Imam Bukhari. He came from Bukhara. The emperor in, uh, he actually invited five and a half thousand Muslims to settle just north of Beijing. The reason why he wanted them to come to Beijing is because he knew the Muslims were very noble warriors. Now, unlike many of the Chinese at the time, you know, you, as you see, the dynasties are changing. You got the Ming Dynasty, you got the Song Dynasty, the Qing. It's changing very quickly. Most of the Chinese, they might not always remain loyal. But he saw the Muslims, on the other hand, were very, you know, noble warriors. What he did is because just north of Beijing, so sort of going closer towards um, the Korean Peninsula, you had uh, an empire that was known as the Liao Empire. And the Liao Empire was threatening the Song Dynasty. So rather than putting Chinese, you know, his own brethren, Han Chinese, in power, he invited these Muslims from Bukhara. Because he said they're going to do a better job than what the Chinese would do defending my land. So he invited these Muslims. Now they were actually led by an Amir. And his name was Amir. But you see, Prince Amir, he actually took on a Chinese name as well. So the people, they knew him as Sol Fai'er. Sol Fai'er. This was his Chinese name. Otherwise, the Muslims in Arabic, they knew him as Amir. Now because he was one of the first Muslims to really um, establish themselves with a, you know, a great respect. They were, they were invited by the emperor. These are people who you know, were very close to the heart of the emperor. Uh, they actually, the Muslims in China today, they call him the father of Islam. Because really, I mean, before you had people trading, going in and out, but he's the first one who really settled in China. And he didn't just settle in China, he was invited by the emperor and had a great respect for the emperor and actually protected them. So that even the Chinese will respect this man. And of course, the Chinese Muslims, out of respect for this, you know, they call him the father of Islam in China. And you see, at this time, in the, in the, the Chinese language, they, used to, they actually used to call Islam Da Shifa. Da Shifa, it means the, the, Ara- the law of the Arabs. Now, what happened was uh, the Amir, uh, what he actually did, Amir Amir, Prince Amir, he said, this name is not suitable. And to say the law of the Arabs, because as we said at the start, the majority of the, uh, of the Muslims that the, the emperor, the, sorry, the, the dynasty knew, were the Arabs that were trading with them. So I said, you know, their religion is the law of the Arabs. But now you've got Muslims from Bukhara. You've got Muslims coming. They're not Arabs. They're from Central Asia. Yeah, closely related to the Persians. They were not, were not Arabs. So what happened was when they actually mixed in with the Chinese people, they became known as the Hui. Because in China, you've got many groups. The largest group... Usually what we call Chinese, they're called the Han. The Han are like the normal Chinese looking people that you've got. You've got a few other groups, but the, the Han are the majority. Now the, the Muslims, they mixed with the Han. And they became known as the Hui. So the, the, the religion of Islam, the name was actually changed. Amir, he said to the, uh, to the emperor, change the name from Dashifa to Hui Hui Jiao. Which means the religion of the Hui. And Hui, by default, it meant the Muslims. So you see, the emperor said, no problem. So from that point onwards, you, know, you had to refer to Muslims as Hui. You couldn't refer to them as Arabs. Now, after this, the Song dynasty eventually fell. Now, we're going to fast forward to the year uh, 1270, 1270. You've got the Yuan dynasty. Now, the Yuan dynasty, uh, this sort of coincides with the Mongols. We're going to look a little bit more at the Mongols. The Mongols actually conquered, you could say, about half of the world. And they started with China. China, because you know, Mongolia is just above China. So one of the first places they conquered was China. And it became known as the Yuan Dynasty. Now the Yuan Dynasty, in some ways, is a high point for the Muslims. And in another way, it becomes a low point for the Muslims. Why? Because of the relationship with the dynasty. Like the Yuan were Mongols. And, and they're different to the Han. You've got the Han Dynasty, for example. Uh, you got the Qing Dynasty, who was named after you know, one of their, their ancestors. So this is just the name that is put in. Uh, still, they refer to their land as China. China or, uh, as you'd say in Chinese, Zhenghua. Zhenghua, it means Middle Kingdom. Middle Kingdom, why? Because they believe they're in the middle of the world. You know, to, the, to the east, you had uh, Japan, which was called you know, the land of the rising sun. And then, of course, in the far west, you had Al-Maghrib, which in China means the place where the sun sets, Morocco. So you say these were the two extremes, and the Chinese believed they were in the middle of the world. Now, we refer to them as the east, because we know in reality they're to the east you know, of the Eurasian subcontinent, uh, the Eurasian you know, macro continent. But they refer to themselves as the middle, middle, uh, middle of the world. And it's from this name Zhenghua, that, you know, most of the, like you actually get this name China that was taken from this. Uh, from Zhenghua to China, it sounds like a big jump, 
but you know, through the, the etymology, etymological changes over time, this is how this name came about. Now we see in the Yuan Dynasty, as I said, in many ways it become a high point. And if you went to the 14th century, under the Yuan Dynasty, there were 4 million Muslims in China. China. So we saw the role of the Muslims in the Yuan Dynasty. And as I mentioned, there were high points. And we see these were many of the high points. Having, you know, Muslims who designed Beijing, the architecture, you know, the respect that was paid to the Muslims. But as we said, the Yuan Dynasty were Mongols. And the Mongols weren't the best people towards the Muslims. You know, they, they were actually waging war with many of the Muslims in the Western fronts. And you saw later on, you know, especially Genghis Khan, he changed many of his policies towards the Muslims. So one of them, for example, is he banned uh, the slaughtering of animals in a halal manner. So it was illegal to do halal slaughtering. This is one of the laws of Genghis Khan. So no doubt, this, you know, this made the Muslims very upset. Uh, the, the law of Genghis Khan, the Yasa, it actually said you're not allowed to slaughter an animal. What you have to do is you have to cut its chest open and rip out its heart. And this was the way that the Mongols would slaughter an animal. So, of course, as Muslims, we know this is impermissible. You have to slaughter it in a halal. It's, it's actually more beneficial for the animal. Yeah, it's more humane. So this was actually made illegal. So you see the Muslims now, uh, after all of these good relations with, the, with the, the government, now all of a sudden they're running into problems. It was said some of the Muslims were actually called to Genghis Khan. And he said, all of the people slaughter the animal how, uh, how we tell you to do, except you Muslims. Why is that? And he said, because our religion mandates that we must slaughter the animal. And he said, well, I say that you shouldn't slaughter the animal. What do you say to this? And he said, I can't submit to this. And so he became very, very angry. And he started to, to oppress many of the Muslims because they refused to obey him. So this became one of, you, you see, it was one of the low points of, of the Muslims, you know, in the Yuan dynasty. Now, because of this, you found many Muslims started to rebel against the Yuan. Because you had the Han. Remember, we're talking about the ethnic Chinese. They, they really resented the fact that Mongols were ruling their land. So as the Mongols were being defeated, Chilo, we're going to talk about this in great detail you know, once we look at the Mongol invasion. They were being defeated by the Muslims, you know, the Mamluks in Egypt. The, the Han said, we're going to take advantage and we're going, to attack, we're going to attack the Mongols as well. So the Muslims joined them. So what they actually did is the, uh, they defeated the Mongols. They actually overthrew the Mongols. And the Muslims, you know, they were some of the main players in this overthrow, this rebellion against the Yuan dynasty. So now we, you know, we fast forward to the Ming dynasty. Once the Yuan had been, uh, you know, displaced, the, the Mongols were kicked out, you had the Ming dynasty. Now this is the golden age of Islam. The Ming dynasty, they were Han Chinese. And they, they were very, very favorable to the Muslims. <clears throat> now the, the, the founder of the, the Ming dynasty, his name was uh, Zhu Yongzhang. Now, he actually founded uh, this dynasty, and he had in his, you know, the whole army, he had six Muslim generals. Now, of course, putting a, a general of the army is a very sensitive position. These are people, if, if, if you don't trust them, they can have a coup and overthrow you. He had six of his generals, they were Muslims. So he sent one of them, who was his most trusted general, to actually go and to continue fighting the Mongols. As we know, uh, the Mongols, they started to attack China again. So the Chinese, they built the Great Wall of China. I'm sure most of us have seen, you know, this long wall which the snakes through the, the mountains. So, yeah, what, the, this, this massive structure, it was actually built to keep the Mongols out. And who did he trust with defending this? One of the Muslim generals. Oh. His name was Lan Yu. Lan Yu, he was a Muslim general and he was the most trusted. Uh, the, the, the emperor, uh, Zhu, uh, Zhu Yongzhang, he actually trusted him above all of the other generals, this Muslim. So what he did is he actually, he was the one responsible for defeating the Mongols. He made sure that they weren't going to ever invade China again. So you can understand, uh, this emperor, he's going to be very thankful to the Muslims. Now you see uh, uh, an amazing thing that actually happened. This emperor, he had such a love for Islam. He had such a love for the Muslims. He actually wrote a, a famous poem. It's called the 100 word eulogy. It was a poem that he wrote in honor of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he actually commanded, because he built many masajid. Again, because he was thankful to the Muslims. He wasn't a Muslim. I'm going to read to you his poem. And it's going to sound like this man's a Muslim from what he's saying. And Allah knows better what was in his heart. But at least he was thankful to the Muslims for defending his empire. He trusted them. He kept them close. 
So he wrote what he wrote what's called the 100 word eulogy. I'm going to read this to you inshallah. Just listen to the beautiful words. This is written by a Chinese emperor, one of the most powerful men in the world at that time, writing a poem about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he said since uh, I'll tell you how it was written first. It's written four Chinese characters at a time. And each line is made up of four Chinese characters. So he said since the creation of the universe, God had already appointed this great faith preaching man from the west he was born and received the holy scripture, a book made of 30 parts, I mean the 30 jewels of the Quran, to guide all of creation, the master of all rulers, the leader of the holy ones, with support from the heavens to protect his nation, with five daily prayers, silently hoping for peace, his heart directed towards Allah, giving power to the poor, saving them from calamity, seeing through the unseen, pulling the souls and the spirits away from all wrongdoings, a mercy to the worlds, transversing the ancient majestic path, vanquishing away all evil, his religion pure and true, Muhammad, the noble and great one. Allah knows best. Really, when you hear these words, you can't help but think this is a Muslim. It really, I mean, you hear these words and you can't think, if he wasn't a Muslim, at least he loved Islam. Now what he did is, he actually established many masjids all around China. He built hundreds of masjids. And he said, I want this poem to be put in every masjid in China. And so you actually see some of the masjid until today, they still have this poem written by this Chinese emperor. 